So greetings and welcome uh, to this uh, quarterly symposium on uh, mode tempo and technological change. Uh, we decided to um, switch in some ways from a colloquium model to a kind of quarterly model to try and get more people focused on it because the, the weekly thing seems to be a little too taxing for everyone. We're all too busy. So hopefully this is a chance for all the people involved in the center and around the campus to focus on some issues and spend a little bit more time on them, which is, accounts for that half-day workshop. And I want to thank, first of all, the, um, the speakers for coming, who've agreed to do something slightly slightly unconventional here, and so far as it's not just about presenting their research, um, but in fact coming into dialogue around this topic. Um, and uh, before we get going, I actually want to um, have a round of applause for the people of the, the staff of the Center for the Cyanogenics who've helped with this, Anna Wavell, Taka Imai, Eric O'Neill, and Rich Mashegi, and all of whom really helped a lot with getting this. <laughs> Without them, I would have long ago collapsed into a kind of quivering mass of unorganized protoplasm <laughs> for lack of being able to handle all this stuff. So, um, I'm not going to go on at too much length here, but I wanted to frame this event in three different ways, just to kind of give some different perspectives on why the topic, or how the topic might be approached, or how to think about why these, these, these particular issues in this context. And so first off, that, that represents a challenge that um, CSG, I think, sees as its métier, which is to bring people in different research traditions into dialogue, not so much to celebrate that happy, shiny object interdisciplinarity that we're all um, supposed to be chasing after, but really to um, look for the seams and gaps in between different research programs or philosophical commitments or historical traditions in the life sciences and the social sciences uh, and the human sciences. So, though all of the panelists appear nominally working on problems that a naive observer might label with the word evolution, it's nonetheless a fact of academic life that research programs, methods, and cognitive styles often form and solidify in particular communities. Often for good intellectual reasons, we hope, mostly for good intellectual reasons, um, but meaning that they need not interact with, or maybe can't interact with, other styles of thought for whom the object is ostensibly the same. So, bringing those things into dialogue is one of the things that I think this is about. Um, this kind of event is about. And I, I'll speak for myself here, but as someone who's trained in cultural anthropology, uh, science studies, I, I, have, I was sort of trained to have a knee-jerk critical reflex whenever evolutionary thinking was applied to any object beside beetles and finches, right? So, you know, like, <laughs> the idea of, uh, of, of using an evolutionary explanation for other things is something that I was trained not to be suspicious of, um, for whatever reason, I'm not entirely sure. Something that I think Thorsten Veblen captured in this notion of trained incapacity. That we all have developed our sort of trained incapacity, that feature of education which causes one, uh, us to be unable to understand things that would be much easier to understand if we hadn't had that training. Right? <laughs> uh, it was a nice notion. And so for myself, this has meant being un often unable to see, for instance, the beauty of evolutionary thinking through a fog of suspicion about how it's being used. Right? <laughs> and so I've been trying to escape that and, and, and think about ways to bring different research traditions together. And to retrain requires looking at how different approaches to a problem might leave out or skip over interesting questions, things that either seem obvious to some people or totally mysterious to others. And so I can't help insinuating that this problem might be a universal one for academics. <laughs> but um, one way around that is to look again at the things that seem most obvious or most mysterious and ask what's going on at the scenes, what's going in those, on in those areas of darkness where we think, oh, that, that, that falls outside of my expertise or that's clearly in the center. So that's one way. I think this is an exercise in comparing our training and capacities. So the second way of uh, framing this event is very different, and it's by reference to a certain popular imagination that's very common today. And that's the imagination I associate with so-called singularitarians or transhumanists. People like Ray Kurzweil or Kevin Kelly, who recently wrote a book called What Technology Wants. And these are popular and, and usually intelligent commentators, usually in Silicon Valley who want to understand what the rapid and accelerating evolution of technology means for human destiny. Um, and its most extreme form is a kind of scientific eschatology. Right? I promise that one day very soon, uh, so like the current date is 2049, um, we will merge completely with technology and become a kind of immortal universal intelligence of made up organized information or something like this. Um, and the problem that I see here, besides the fact that that's a manifestly kooky way of approaching the world, <laughs> uh, is that um, and though certainly no less influential for that, they command the public stage to a certain extent today, and, and that's, that's important. 
But the problem is that they have their own form of trained in capacity. And what, what these folks take for granted is that there's a certain scientific explanation of what evolution is or what evolution of technology is, which in the end I think bears almost no resemblance to how biologists, anthropologists, uh, philosophers, or economists actually, actually think about these problems. And, and so the fact that they command this public stage means that it's, it's, it might be incumbent upon us um, to re-articulate them. What are the um, uh, capacities of thinking evolutionarily about technology? And in some ways to confront those popular notions of the evolution of technology. So think of this frame as kind of a challenge to take these questions seriously, both as an academic workshop, but also as a, you know, a more public problem. And the third way of framing this is actually very local, and that's grown out of discussions with Mike Alfaro. Uh, he and I taught a class on evolution in the spring. Uh, who, Mike's an evolutionary biologist whose primary interest is in the field of macroevolution. He'll tell us about um, this. And I think of this as the sort of evolution, um, the really long scale and the really bird's eye view of diversity of, of life, right? Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with Mike and talking with him about things like adaptive radiation and extinction, about Stephen Jay Gould or the Burgess Sale, about questions of how one builds phy phylogenetic trees using statistical tools. And from this, I've started to realize that there's a kind of conceptual or philosophical object at the center of this kind of work, and that, that is diversity, right? The object is diversity in some ways. And it, it may seem obvious to say this, right? These, this is one of those places where it probably seems to some people obvious, but perhaps this, you know, loops back to our trained in capacities. What seems at first obvious is a mystery for those trained to think differently. So my, my weak brain cannot quite capture <laughs> entirely the concept of diversity. Um, but actually, I think what makes this interesting is that diversity is not just difference or variation. It's not just the fact that there are being different things on the planet. It's a concept that increasingly has structure and exactitude built into it. And I think about this along the lines of the way the population became an object for biologists. Uh, moving from something that Malthus identified as a problem to something which Darwin needed to give structure and exactitude to in order to articulate the theory of evolution. And so diversity has a similar kind of capacity to, today to become that kind of structured object or concept for thinking with. And so the reason I, I sort of point this out in discussions with Mike is that I always thought it was just sort of simple curiosity. It was like, why can't we look at software? Why can't we look at cell phones? Why can't we look at these other things? I thought, maybe he's just asking me because he's really interested in cell phones. But, <laughs> but I came to realize that actually he's actually looking for cases of diversity in the and to, and to apply these tools to, to look at diversity as a, as a phenomenon in the world. So I wanted to frame it a bit in that way, because that's a different way of framing the evolution of technology than, than has been framed in the past by most observers, I think. Um, at least I hope it is, maybe it's not. Uh, but it's a, it's a third frame, and you can think of that as a kind of challenge to understanding what, um, what technology is and why diversity might be related. So those are sort of three very broad frames that one can use to think about this. They may or may not come up in uh, the presentations from people, but they might be a place to start asking questions as we go along, too. And I could probably spend another half hour introducing all the panelists, given their collective awards and accolades. Uh, but I think I'll just do a brief biographical tour, which reveals some interesting overlaps. So Mike Alfaro teaches here at UCLA in ecology and evolutionary biology. His PhD is from the University of Chicago in the Evolutionary Biology Department and in what will constitute a particularly dense Northern California heritage on this panel as a, PA, a BA from UC Davis in Dramatic Arts. Uh, Johann Peter Merman has stoically joined us from the Australian School of Business, the University of New South Wales. Thank you for coming across the ocean. Um, his PhD is from Columbia University in the Management of Organizations and his Northern California heritage is that he holds a BA in Philosophy from UC Berkeley. And just so you know, if you don't know Peter's work, if you've ever had any unanswered question of literally any kind about synthetic dye, now is your chance to find out the answer. <laughs> He's written an amazing book that's uh, dense with detail about the evolution of the synthetic dye industry from 18, roughly 1850. Rob Boyd teaches here in the Anthropology Department, in the Anthropology Department, and his PhD is from UC Davis's Ecology Department. And he holds a BA from UCSD in Physics. And James Griesemer joins us from, wait for it, UC Davis. <laughs> and his PhD is from the University of Chicago's Conceptual Foundation Science uh, program. His BA is from Berkeley in Genetics. So uh, kind of interesting kind of biographical overlaps here, which might account to some extent for the um, So there's a lot more I can say about these folks, but I'll let them start speaking. So without further ado, Mike is going to uh, regale us with stories of phylogenetics as it has evolved. <laughs> Sounds like you're uh, trained in capacity.
capacitance is uh, you're trying to break free of that, so I want you to know that my talk today will include both finches and needles. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to see if I can get this remote working here. There's too much diversity. <laughs> Well, I guess I'll just go to the analog event. All right, so uh, what I want to do today is uh, introduce you to the, um, the major questions in macroevolution and give you the, uh, an introduction to the perspectives of an evolutionary biologist working on questions of uh, diversity. And um, I'm going to, um, through my, throughout my talk, I'm going to uh, try and imagine uh, the ways that some of these ideas, some of these tools, some of these conceptual frameworks uh, might be used to um, study questions or think about questions of technological change. Um, and uh, I had, uh, I just imagined in my mind while I was uh, preparing this talk what Chris might want me to do for this talk, but I never actually asked him, so um, I don't know if I'll be successful. But I want to uh, let you all know that um, you should feel free to ask me any questions um, during my talk if, you, uh, if there's any points that aren't clear or, um, or if, there's, uh, if you have any comments um, because we have a very diverse audience uh, in this group and I want to make sure that um, I'm bringing all of you along for the, the big picture stuff. Uh, and, and, so, uh, major features of macroevolution, uh, borrowing from a, an important book on uh, macroevolution, Major Features of Evolution by uh, George Gaylord Simpson. And uh, I'll start with a, a very common pattern that we find in biology when we look at patterns of diversity across the tree of life. So, what I'm showing you here is a very simplified phylogeny um, of two groups of organisms that both shared a common ancestor about 230 million years ago. On the one hand, uh, in 230 million years, this lineage has spawned two living species, the two species of Tuatara, um, while the other lineage has given rise to this enormous radiation of birds, uh, sorry, lizards and snakes, over 8,000 species. So this is a very striking uh, pattern of uneven species richness um, that's evolved since the common ancestor 230 million years ago. Evolutionary biologists look at patterns like this and they say, what's going on? Why is there so much diversity on this side? On this side, why have two atars failed to diversify? Or why have they failed to diversify but also managed to stick around for this amount of time? So one of the main questions that we study in macroevolution is uneven patterns of species richness. And we can also uh, find similar examples of phenotypic or morphological uh, unevenness across the tree of life. So here's some, um, <coughs> some cichlid fishes from uh, the African rip lakes. These are a, another classic study of adaptive radiation. We'll be talking about adaptive radiation uh, a little bit later. But there's an enormous amount of, of color diversity, shape diversity, behavioral diversity, um, and feeding um, diversity found within this group. Um, and then we have uh, other groups like... Um, are, are the fish cichlids? Yes, those are cichlids, that's right. Um, and then we have other groups, um, such as hagfishes, when they're, where there's far fewer, uh, there's fewer species, certainly, but there's also, even within those species, they're, they're um, of the same, the same kind. There's less obvious morphological or phenotypic diversity, there's less ecological diversity. And so we might ask, what accounts for the tremendous amount of ecological and phenotypic diversity that we see in some groups and the, more, the lack of morphological diversity in other groups. So macroevolution is really focused on answering these kinds of questions, um, or questions that are related to these kinds of diversity. So the kinds of questions that uh, we deal with in macroevolution are questions like, why are there so many of this kind of species? Um, when did certain groups uh, diversify, did the diversity of some group affect the uh, timing of diversification of another group, such as um, 
mammals diversifying after dinosaurs went extinct. Um, we ask kind of theoretical questions. Do we see linked diversification of phenotype and uh, speciation across the tree of life? Now, um, I think these are, are really some of the most fascinating questions in evolutionary biology, and that uh, accounts for my uh, chosen profession. Um, and what I want to do now is give you some insight into how we, we test these kinds of ideas in, in my field. And I'll um, use beetles to um, illustrate this. Um, as you may know, there are a lot of beetles on Earth. Um, perhaps one out of every four animals uh, on Earth is a beetle, um, illustrated by this, uh, this chart here showing diversity. And um, there's a... We're on the sliver of one percent. Yeah, so that now you, get a, you start to get a sense of the, um, the, the narcissism of uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, where do we fit in with it compared to the diversity of uh, total vertebrates, which is yeah, just staggeringly small when we look across um, animal life. Yes. Um, so way more beetles than vertebrates, um, and way more beetles uh, really than, um, than any other um, major lineage of animals. Um, and so there's a question, can you ask a question, why are there so many um, kinds of beetles? We don't know the answer to that question, but we have some ideas. Um, one idea that um, um, has been studied is, uh, is asking whether the diversification of beetles is linked in some way to the diversification of flowering plants. Now, flowering plants um, are the most uh, species-rich lineage of, of living plants. And, um, and so one idea is that um, the reason that there are so many beetles is that they co-diversified with flowering plants. And if we could explain what is causing flowering plants to diversify, then perhaps we could explain what's going on with beetles. Well, how could we, how could we test this kind of idea? And um, it's a very... Um, difficult idea to sort of test in a laboratory because um, this played out over um, hundreds of millions of years, over a hundred billion years anyway. Um, so one of the ways that we approach a question like this is by using um, phylogenetic trees. And so what I'm showing... Could you go back a couple slides? Sure. Where are bees and wasps? Is that 8%? They co-evolved with plants that flowered, right? That's right. Well, that's a, at least that's a, that's a uh, it certainly is a reasonable uh, hypothesis to uh, assume that these, uh, that these pollinators co-evolved with um, flowering plants. Okay, so one of the ways that a macroevolutionists can test this kind of idea is by looking at the pattern of relationship, the phylogenetic tree um, of beetles, and what we're seeing here is a very simplified phylogeny for beetles, and we, uh, where each one of these um, branches at the ends, at the tops of the phylogeny, is leading to an extant group of beetles. All right, and these numbers indicate the species richness of these various groups, and the colors uh, are indicating whether the beetles, that beetle lineage, predominantly feeds on plants that aren't flowering plants, these non-angiosperms in red, or flowering plants in green. And so what you can see is that, first of all, transitions, colonizations of flowering plants have evolved at least three times independently on this phylogeny. So beetles have managed to um, transition to feeding on angiosperms three different times at least. And each time, the lineage of Antisperm uh, feeding beetles has given rise to an enormous species richness compared to its closest non antisperm feeding relatives. And we have a, a, a statistical toolkit where we can ask whether these kinds of differences in species richness are, are significant in some sense. And so, uh, in the case of beetles, um, it, it certainly is. Um, and this is a kind of phylogenetic. Uh, tree thinking that is very common in uh, macroevolution, macroevolutionary studies today. 
So lots of our studies rely now on uh, on the tree of life, um, and we this is an idea that um, that comes from Darwin's work, The Origin of the Species. Um, the great hypothesis that all life shares a common ancestor implies that closely related taxa will share a more recent common ancestor than more distantly related taxa, and we can expect a greater degree of shared similarity because of that fact between taxa that have shared more recent common ancestors. Um, so phylogenies um, are very useful in making evolutionary comparisons. And um, I'll just briefly show you a, a, a simplified phylogeny. Um, we are, we'll generally be comparing phylogenies or looking at phylogenies where all of the extant taxa are at the ends of the phylogeny, at the tips of the phylogeny. And these branches um, connect tips to, at nodes, and these nodes represent a, the common ancestor of those two taxa. <clears throat> and so you can see that a phylogeny shows a hierarchical or nested pattern of relationship between taxa that are more closely related to one another and uh, groups of taxa that uh, we call clades, all of the descendants of a common ancestor um, that are evolution, each other's uh, evolutionary cousins or each other's closest evolutionary relatives. Um, so trees are important to studies of macroevolution because they reveal this pattern of shared history and they provide a time scale for understanding the tempo of evolution. Now, uh, one of the most important uh, ideas in comparative biology or macroevolutionary study is that species are not independent. We need the phylogenies to ascertain the degree of non-independence. If, if you collected data on species and you found um, a pattern of relationship between these two characters in the 20 species that you measured, you might conclude that there's a strong correlation between those two, uh, those two traits. However, if those traits evolved in a phylogeny that looks like this, um, you would be, have been misled. That similarity would be due to the, the common ancestor, which we really have here is a group of 10 taxa that evolved very quickly um, at one point in time. And so these 10 taxa are, are not independent of one another. They've shared a long evolutionary history along this branch. And the same with this lower clade. And in fact, um, if we look at the pattern of relationship between those two traits within those two clades, we can see that there is no relationship within those two groups. So this is a fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental reasons that phylogenies are so often used in uh, evolutionary biology, um, because uh, it's important to take account, uh, take into account shared ancestry in making comparisons. Uh, another is that the phylogenies um, can be time calibrated to provide a time scale for interpreting patterns of diversification. So here's a, a um, group, here's a figure showing two families of uh, marine fishes, the, uh, damsel fishes and pomocentrids, which you can see um, all tend to have a similar body plan, a similar shape, there's not a lot of color diversity, and uh, the labyrinths, and I've shown you um, some diversity of the labyrinths here. There are about 300 species of damselfishes and close to 600 species of labyrinths, uh, but you can see that there's much greater color diversity, shape diversity, and there's much higher ecological diversity within the labyrinths as well. These are saltwater, like yeah, these are fish? Mm -hmm. These are uh, coral reef dwelling uh, families of fish. Now, one explanation for the difference in um, ecological diversity or morphological diversity between these two groups is that the labyrinths have evolved their diversity at a faster rate, their phenotypic diversity at a faster rate. However, if we don't know the ages of these two families, um, we actually can't make that, we can't test that idea. So, for example, if we assume, if we know that the pomocentrids and the labyrinths are of about the same age, then yes, the greater diversity that we see within the labyrinths um, would be explained by a faster rate of morphological evolution. However, if the labyrinths are simply an older group, 
then they might have the same rate of morphological evolution, or even a slower rate than the, dam the damselfishes, but they just had more time to accumulate that diversity. So phylogenies um, are also important in macroevolutionary comparisons because they allow us to, um, to ask questions or to ascertain rates of uh, diversification and evolution. All right, so with that uh, introduction to um, phylogenies and macroevolution, I want to talk about some big ideas, some active areas in macroevolution that might relate to technological change. And I want to give you, um, I want to introduce you to ideas about adaptive radiations and key innovations, uh, punctuated evolution, evolvability, and diversity limits, and mass extinction, and explore whether any of these uh, ideas, which are, um, are very uh, active areas of research in evolutionary biology, might have some applicability to thinking about patterns of technological uh, diversity or evolution. So let's start with adaptive radiation. Um, this will get to the, uh, the finches uh, in a moment. Um, the, this is another adaptive radiation. If you um, go to Hawaii, you can be, you'll be struck by the tremendous diversity of many of the um, plants and animals that are found there. The Hawaiian honey creepers are, are one such group. If you look um, on the islands, there are about 40 species of honey creepers that exhibit a tremendous amount of color variation, and they also show variation in their uh, morphologies and phenotypes that is strongly associated with their diet, um, that's associated with their uh, how they're making a living with their ecological niche. And uh, evolutionary biologists are really fascinated in, by the these examples of radiations, especially we see them especially on islands where groups um, that we know have recently uh, invaded um, habitats that, that uh, did not have uh, that are that are relatively depauperate have, in a short amount of evolutionary time, diversified and radiated to fill um, ecological niches. And so here are the finches, uh, Darwin's Galapagos, uh, finches, Geospiza. We have 14 species of Geospiza, and they show uh, tremendous diversity compared to their, um, their closest evolutionary cousins, the mainland finches, um, in the shapes of their bills and in the dietary diversity found in the group. All right, so a lot of active research today is in understanding um, how evolutionary adaptive radiations occur, um, how we can test for adaptive radiations, if we can learn anything about if there are general principles to how groups um, that first arrive and are presented with the opportunity to radiate um, do radiate and fill available niches. And I'm going to summarize our ecological theory of adaptive radiation for you right now. Uh, we define this as the evolution of ecological and phenotypic diversity within a rapidly multiplying lineage. So the idea is that adaptive radiations are changes from the regular tempo of evolution that's been occurring in the lineage before it's, um, it started radiating. And this radiation includes both the pro production of more species, of new species, and change morphological change that is tied to the new niches that are presumably being invaded by the new species. Um, and so we, we think about adaptive radiation as speciation plus adaptation in the context of ecological opportunity. Now I'll talk about ecological opportunity um, in a few moments, um, but I guess I'll talk about it right now. Um, <laughs> so ecological opportunity is a it's a it's a a term that can be used to describe um, a lack of competitors. It can be used uh, that may be present when a colonizing um, uh, species uh, population arrives on an island or on, in some other habitat where um, there aren't its regular. Uh, Components of uh, competitors. 
um, or other members of the community so that that, uh, that population is now able to exploit uh, resources that it wasn't able to exploit in its previous habitat. Um, it could be the um, potential to invade new um, niches to uh, discover uh, new ways of making a, uh, making a living ecologically uh, due to the evolution of a new trait, uh, a new feature. Um, and the idea of ecological opportunity is that op the radiation is a function of there being empty niches. So somehow the colonizing population has to be able to exploit, has to gain access to resources that it didn't have access to before. And it also has to have uh, the traits uh, which will allow it to exploit those new uh, opportunities. So uh, here's an example, uh, another example from fish on coral reefs. Uh, fishes have invaded coral reefs um, more than 20 times in um, uh, recent evolutionary history. And we can find uh, in these radiations on coral reefs diversification of uh, fishes into different dietary types, dietary habits. We, uh, if you're living on a coral reef, you can find crustaceans to eat, plankton, um, hard shell mollusks, uh, other fish. Um, you can graze algae or coral. Um, and so there's a great diversity of, of trophic niches that are available on coral reefs that are not available in other marine habitats. And we want to distinguish the idea of ecological adaptive radiation to radiations that don't have this ecological component. So here's um, another group of, of fishes, uh, the parrot fishes, and these actually are a kind of rats. They're, they're found within the rats. Um, and I want to draw your attention to this group of these two genera of parrot fishes, uh, Scarus and Chloror, as indicated by the star here. This group is very young evolutionarily. It's um, about six to eight million years old. But about 55 species of parrot fishes have evolved in that amount of time. So over half of the diversity of all of the parrot fishes in this larger group have evolved right here. Now, we don't consider this to be an ecological adaptive radiation, even though we have a large number of species appearing in this period of time, because the diversity that we see is related to coloration. Um, these species will form mixed species uh, feeding uh, flocks. So all of these, um, all the members of these two genera feed on, on algae, either by grazing algae, uh, or some of them um, have more powerful jaws and actually eat the uh, coral polyps that are, that are found on the reef. But they, they tend to eat the same kinds of things. You can see that they tend to have the same kinds of shapes uh, in their bodies. Where they differ um, is in their, um, uh, in their uh, uh, sexual behavior. So, um, the hypothesis is that the diversity that we see within this group is related to changes in mating systems and uh, mating behaviors, but isn't related to the other aspects of ecology, which I talked about before. So the idea of an adaptive radiation, I, I point this out because um, we want to have ecological adaptive radiation be something that is different from other kinds of speciation or radiation when we're studying uh, diversity on phylogenetic trees. We don't want to say that changing the number of species every single time on a tree indicates an adaptive radiation. Um, what we think is important from the study of adaptive radiation is that ecological opportunity appears um, over and over again throughout the history of life on the planet. And when that opportunity appears, we get a change. We get an increased pulse of diversification. We get lineages that rapidly fill those niches um, we get an increase in speciation, and we get an increase in morphological evolution uh, <coughs> until that potential has been realized. All right, so here's a, a, a model of that. Uh, a species has ecological opportunity, enters, um, um, sometimes we call these uh, adaptive zones. This is just a potential 
to diversify in the face of ecological opportunity. We have fast diversification both in terms of number of species and in the uh, diversity, in the phenotypic diversity that's evolving within those species. And then those rates, are, those initially high rates, are not sustained. They slow with time. So these signatures, fast initial diversification in species number, fast initial morphological change, and a slowing through time, are the signals of adaptive radiation that we often test for in macroevolutionary studies. So here's a, a phylogenetic tree of uh, warblers. And if you look at this phylogeny, you can see that a lot of the branching events occur really close to the, what we call the root of the tree. These branching events have occurred, generally occurred early in the history of the clade. What that means is that speciation is fast early in the history of the group, um, and we see that it slows down through time. We have um, we have specific uh, statistical ways that we can test whether their, the speciation rate has slowed significantly through time. One way to visualize that pattern of the tempo of diversification on the tree is by plotting time on the x-axis and the log number of lineages. Um, that are present at any time point on the y-axis. And what we would expect if there was uh, diversification occurring at a constant rate is that there should be a log-linear relationship between species richness and time. But what we find for these warblers is that there, in fact, is very fast diversification initially yeah. in their history, and it slows with time as we approach the present. So this kind of evidence is taken um, in, as support for ideas of adaptive radiation. Um, to give you an example of how we might test for um, the rapid phenotypic uh, evolution component of adaptive radiation, here's a phylogeny of uh, living whales, the cetaceans, and we can take um, a phylogeny, we can look at a trait like body size, we can ask if, that, if the rate of evolution of body size has been constant over the history of this tree or whether the rate of evolution has been quick, has been faster earlier in the history of the phylogeny, phylogeny and has slowed over time. So this plot is showing um, the, the rate of body size evolution on the y-axis here and the um, estimates of the rate from divergences that are deep within the phylogeny um, towards the, the, uh, the right of this plot, or right of the graph here, and the earliest, the youngest divergences, the most recent splits um, at the origin. So what we see, again, is evidence that's consistent with adaptive radiation in cetaceans where there was a faster rate of change in body size in the um, deepest splits, in the earliest divergences within the cetaceans, and that rate of body size diversification has slowed as we approach the present. Does, uh Cetacean include both whales and dolphins? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So dolphins have remained small relative to whales that have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Are the bigger points related to the absolute maximum size? Uh, they are related to uh, the how much change there is within the group um, that, um, that is uh, contained within. But that's not a proportionality curve. That's a rate curve. That's right. We're looking at we're looking at how much uh, size evolution. If we, what we're doing is estimating kind of the rate of size evolution that's occurred here and here and here and here as we approach the tips of the phylogeny. And and um, and so really we're trying to estimate how much size change um, is contained within how much diversity in size is, is contained within each of the clades. Um, where we calculate the rate as we approach the tips of the tree. So 50 million years ago, there wasn't a lot of diversity in size. And that it shows up in the last 8 or 7 million years. Well, really what, what that plot I showed you is that the, the, the amount, uh, if we estimate the rate of size evolution, um, um, really between uh, this group, the, the, uh, the way we're estimating our, our rate is by looking at 
pairs of uh, the amount of size evolution on one side of a node and the other side yeah. of a node. Okay. And um, we're trying to uh, explain that disparity in sizes on either side of the phylogeny width by assuming that there's been a, a model rate of which is that far five minutes or five million years before the end of the <laughs> Whichever comes first. <laughs> all right, so, um, all right, so, are there, uh, is there any applicability of this idea of, of technological, or rather ecological adaptive radiation to technology? Certainly the idea of opportunity um, seems to have uh, an, an analogy um, with ideas about technological opportunity. Um, this is a plot um, showing the cumulative number of apps that appear in the app store for the iPhone. And, um, so you can imagine that that is opportunity that didn't exist before for app developers. Um, you can see this, this very rapid um, growth that is a portion of the plot. Um, we need to talk about this. <laughs> Uh, are there, is there more ecological opportunity in some environments than other environments? Here's another plot showing uh, the growth in apps um, in three different environments, iTunes, uh, Facebook, and MySpace. Um, just want to move uh, along here. What's the role of innovation in diversification in biology? The idea of key innovations has been around for a long time. Here's a, a, a dinosaur with wings, uh, looking down on a dinosaur without wings. And uh, this guy has a bright evolutionary history ahead of him. And uh, <laughs> not so much for that guy. Um, here's uh, the earliest fishes in the Silurians uh, did not really have jaws that, um, that could close. And uh, the evolution of jaws uh, heralded um, great things for the 1% of the vertebrates that, we, that are around today. Um, and uh, so they, there, there is this idea in biology that key evolutionary traits drive adaptive radiation, drive ecological adaptive radiations. Um, we have methods for testing those kinds of hypotheses because they make the prediction that when the, the trait appears, there should be a shift in the diversification rate following the evolution of that trait. So here's um, teleost. Um, here's an example. Um, there's a hypothesis that Teleost fishes, which uh, include 99% of the fish that live today, experience a genome duplication event um, at their origin. And that, that that extra copy of the entire genome somehow fueled the diversification of teleos. And that's, um, here's a phylogeny of showing teleos, uh, these numbers here show the number of <coughs> genera, but the idea is that there's just a tremendous species richness of teleos and the, the closest evolutionary cousins to Teleos have very few species. Um, and so uh, macroevolution has a, a, tool, a toolkit where we can take a phylogeny here. We're showing major lineages of fishes. These colors indicate the species found within them. We can ask whether there's a diversification rate shift um, that falls on the phylogeny here at the, at the common ancestor of Teleos, and in fact it does. So this is uh, one way that we can test key innovation hypotheses. Um, it's not been applied to technological change as far as I know, but you know, we do, there is so much emphasis on innovation when we talk about technology, it seems like um, there should be predictions about the, the pace or the tempo of diversification following these uh, innovations. Um, are diversification and speciation coupled? Um, in biology, there, uh, Niles Eldridge uh, and Stephen Jay Gould uh, hypothesized that, that change, that phenotypic change, is strongly associated with speciation. Um, and that once species form, they maintain their morphologies for long periods of time. This is a theory of punctuated equilibrium. Um, and um, there have been a lot of tests of this idea in evolutionary biology. Um, here's a, a molecular phylogenetic perspective on testing that hypothesis. What I've shown you here is uh, a phylogeny of, of the uh, ray finned fishes, of, of most of the fish. These um, circles are stand ins for um, about 200 families. The branches here are proportional to the speciation rate that's found within those families. 
And the colors at the tips of these phylogenies are indicating the rate of morphological evolution, the rate of size evolution within those families. So what you can see um, is that there's a strong pattern when we look across the entire fish tree of life um, of families to have high, uh, families that have low, rather, diversification rates, that is short branches, to also have low rates of body size evolution. And for other groups that have high rates of speciation to um, also have high rates of body size evolution. Um, are there controls? What are the major controls on diversity? So um, we are really interested in looking at patterns of diversity over time. This is a very famous um, study by, or a series of studies by Jackson Kowski showing the diversity on the y-axis here of marine invertebrates over geologic time. Um, and there's um, one of the conclusions that one can reach by looking at this is that for a large period um, of the Paleozoic, uh, diversity reached a plateau. Diversity did not go up um, indefinitely. It reached uh, a plateau. This group, one, two. Uh, we can also see these, uh, these sudden drops in diversity, which are extinctions, which I, uh, maybe I'll be able to say a word about those. Um, so that's a perspective across the entire history of life on Earth. Um, and we see evidence for some limits on diversity. If we look at young groups, if we look at diversification in young groups, we find speciation rates that are far, far, far um, faster than diversification rates that we estimate when we take that this broad perspective back. So here's um, carnations from a recent study. You can see um, that within the last uh, million and a half years, there's been this tremendous radiation of carnations. Um, these things are accumulating right now at the rate of about um, three to seven species per million years. Um, if they are able to sustain that rate, we'll be drowning in carnations <laughs> in, uh, in the next couple of million years. So, uh, but the thing is, the thing that we, we find over and over again in macroevolution is that young clades have very fast rates of diversification, but these rates are not sustained um, when we look at broader patterns in the fossil record. So um, very quickly, if we look at the, um, this plot is showing um, the relationship between age and richness for um, for flowering plants, for families of flowering plants. And what we see when we look across in a plot like this is that there's no relationship between the age of the group and the number of species that it has. And what we would expect if those high spe initial speciation rates were being maintained is that, um, is that the oldest groups, because they've been around the longest, because they've been diversifying the longest, should have the most species. We don't see that. We don't see that. We don't see that. If we look across the entire tree of life, the only possible group in which we see older groups having more species are beetles. Um, and, and so this lack of a relationship between age and diversity is evidence that, um, that there are limits on the diversity that can be achieved by, by each of these major groups in the tree of life. Um, so, I think this is uh, important because, um, as Chris was talking about this uh, obsession with technological change, rates of technological evolution, this, uh, you look at Moore's Law, or um, these, these other graphs of technological change, we see these, these rapid increases that give rise to um, some creative ideas. <laughs> um, but. What, as a, as a macroevolutionist, it, it just seems to me like these, uh, I, I, I don't expect that those rates would be sustained, uh, that, that the rate, the processes that we see um, at shallow scales um, don't necessarily translate when we start looking at deeper time. Um, should I finish, Chris, or should I say? Okay. All right, so um, I would, uh, maybe if we have a discussion, I could talk about extinction. I think extinction, uh, extinction shapes diversity patterns um, in very important ways today, and I don't think there's 
been a real um, emphasis of, or a perspective on extinction in how extinction shapes patterns of diversity um, in technology. But um, with that, I'll just kind of jump ahead to the, to the end here and say that uh, what macroevolution um, might be useful outside of biology, uh, uh, the ways it might be useful is that we, we have a, a good toolbox for assessing dynamics of change, uh, at least for biological uh, units. And we have lots of ideas and some conceptual frameworks for interpreting diversity patterns, uh, but there are challenges uh, which we can talk about um, to perhaps applying these ideas outside um, of biology. So, thank you very much. scales that we're talking about here. So uh, thinking about what it means to talk about evolution over millions and billions of years as opposed to evolution over hundreds of years and how one can think about scales both temporally and in terms of the diversity of things on the planet and what kinds of things that exist in diversity. But uh, we're happy to have Peter Merman here to talk about economic and organizational change and theories of that in um, uh, respect to with respect to technology. Thanks a lot. I also took a guess what um, you might be interested in, so this is my It's not all about me, really. <laughs> <laughs> and what I will try to do is I will try to uh, limit my 35 minutes that I have to about 25 minutes so that I can then open up the floor and actually have some questions because there could be many things I could talk about and I really have to limit myself to um, some aspects of what I've been doing. And what will happen is when I show you uh, I think it will trigger questions in your mind, and I, I enjoy very much your talk, it will a lot of questions in my mind, so here's what I'm uh, planning to do. I will first try to give you an overview of what fundamentally, if I look at all of the research I've been doing since I started to talk to what is it really about? Um, and my answer is actually trying to get a better handle on what is the origin of confidence in the economy, that individuals, countries. So I'm going to talk about this for a moment, and then I'm going to show you some empirical patterns about the development of the synthetic dye industry in five countries over a 70 year period. And then I'm going to run this through an evolution interpretation. But I want to show you the patterns first because you may actually say, look, I can explain this in different ways. And then I'm going to come uh, to the end to draw some conclusions about uh, I'm presently writing a chapter which is overdue. Uh, <laughs> many of you know this feeling. So in fact, this is the part I agreed to come here because I know this would force me to actually start really delivering the chapter which I have so this, uh, These are the conclusions about how I'm trying to structure the So fundamentally, when I started out as a doctoral student, social sciences, I was really interested in answering this basic question, you know, how come there's some countries which are so rich and other countries are so poor? You know, how do we explain these gigantic diversities in uh, economic performance? And you can really frame this at, uh, the le at different levels of analysis. And most fundamentally, uh, you know, uh, I would contend that while um, the average person may not see it that way, but the reason why the U.S., even now in the economic crisis, is doing so much better than uh, most countries in the world is because the American economy, individuals and organizations, are extremely competent at producing products and services. And so then this big question, well, if you are a country which is behind, you know, how would you actually go about creating competencies at the level of the individual, of groups, of regions, what does this actually uh, entail? And one important background fact that to share with you, you know, most of you would have bumped into have colleagues in economics or maybe in business school. 
And uh, when you start having conversations with people in the economics department of business schools, until about 15 years ago, economics, you know, of course, was a um, dominant idea of the classic economics, where there's this theoretical fiction that the economic agent knows everything about the world, and then you can create mathematical models and then create uh, prediction about behavior. Now, evolutionary thinking in economics is fundamentally a reaction against us that, look, the individual agents simply don't have the knowledge to do what you want them to do. So let's actually try, try to build a more realistic model of what individual human beings can do in terms of decision making uh, and in terms of what organizations can do and even policy makers. And in the field of management, um, and you see this in Jack Welch, and I, once you understand what he's doing, uh, then you actually also become a hero of management. And basically, in the field of management, I and other, you know, you know the first one, the, when this evolution of thinking came in and management organization theory in the 1970s, it was a reaction against the notion that an individual human being has the capacity to know so much about a rapidly changing world that you can, by the force of your intelligence, design the adaptive strategy. So this notion being that success is actually a function of trying out different things. Some of them work, and those which work, you do more of. That's deeply evolutionary, as opposed to, I can think of the problem have one trial and it's the perfect adaptation. So when I was doing my work, I must say, in a management department under the very much I was interested in, in showing, look, there is a huge amount of trial and error that goes on to really come up with competent organizations of competent economies. And this is in part what I'm trying to help demonstrate. So what I'm not going to do is I'm going to show you the context um, of the synthetic dye industry. Now, the only reason why I chose this industry, I will say, it's not because I was fundamentally interested in dyes, or I want you to be fundamentally interested in dyes. The dyes yeah. doesn't matter. It is just an, an, an unbelievably good context to look at some of these questions that I've been just alluding to, um, because it is uh, billed by the historians as the first science-based industry. And, and, and uh, what they mean by that typically is, clearly, science and technology have always been important in terms There was a very short time gap between a fundamental discovery in a laboratory of a student at Royal College of Chemistry and the industry starting. I mean, he decided to leave the university against the advice of his professor and started a uh, firm with his father and brother. And um, so there's a rapid translation into uh, the economic sphere and the production. So I'm going to tell you that story a bit, and then I'm going to walk through and interpret this through. So basically, um, William Henry Perkins creates the first dye, a, a purple, and then for the, this is 1857, and within um, the next five years, British and French firms are dominant industries. If you do market share data at the time, it's about 50% market share for the British, and 40% uh, is French, the Germans have a little bit, the Swiss have a little bit, the Americans don't. And then the professor, who did not counsel his student to go into this business, you know, for a scientist to start a firm, come on, you must be kidding. You're a stake, true to, to science now. This professor later on started to design his own dye, you know, his laboratory, when his student showed him how much money you can actually get for this. <laughs> uh, and in 1862, because he was a legal organic chemist, he's being asked to predict so. What country is going to continue dominating? And of course, of course, it's going to be Great Britain. It's very simple. That by far the largest market for dyes textile is in this country. The raw materials, namely coal tar, which was a waste product of aluminum gas, is also in this country. So all of the 
natural light producing countries like India, like uh, parts of France, they will lose our ratio and we, the British, uh, will dominate this. Now here is what happens. Eight years later, the Germans have 50% market share. <laughs> the British and French are reduced to 20%. And in uh, 885, for the next 30 years, and this is an interesting question, you know, why did the Germans dominate this for 30 years? You know, with a market share anywhere between 85% and 95%, depending upon whether you count the plants the Germans bought up in France and Britain after they did this <laughs> failed. And these patterns were pretty much known in the in history of science and history of technology. But what nobody had done is actually collect data on the number of entries and failed firms in those industries. And so what I, what I did, did, building upon eight years of work of a group in the Netherlands, 